Coming up on DTNS, we are all still at CES because CES is everywhere. And we have all the big chip announcements from AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. There's a Sony car and Robert Heron and Patrick Norton are here to help us wrap our heads around all the home theater announcements and what it means for us. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And, That's uh, you, Patrick. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're next Louis, on the, if you look on line nine of our rundown, it says Patrick Norton goes next. <laughs> Last time I was on, I was told not to speak. And now I'm, uh, anyhow, from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Patrick Norton. <laughs> and from beautiful California, Robert Heron, sitting right here. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Hey, you know, when you're live from the CS show floor, it's, it's stuff like that's bound to happen. It's totally fine. Uh, we were just talking about apples, uh, literally apples, the fruit on Good Day Internet. Uh, if you want to hear that and a lot of other uh, nostalgic conversations about childhoods and other things, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. It's an obit, guys. Sorry, but true. Mm -hmm. This morning, surrounded by friends and developers, Flash said goodbye to the world. It was born January 1st, 1996, as Macromedia Flash with support for vectors, motion, even some bitmaps. In 2005, it began a relationship with Adobe and rose to prominence as the power behind video and entertainment on the web. A lack of mobile support led to Flash's decline and an eventual fade into obscurity. Apple announced, Adobe rather, announced it with full support after a final update in December, although I'm not sure Apple's bummed out about that. Adobe Flash was 25 and will be missed. Take, take a moment. <laughs> we'll miss you. WhatsApp issued a clarification of its privacy policy change set to take effect February 8th. The change requires all users to agree to a policy that lets businesses store WhatsApp chat logs on Facebook servers. That That's all it does. WhatsApp says that it doesn't keep its own logs of who people message. That wasn't clear originally. Uh, it doesn't share contacts with Facebook and it doesn't see your location data and it has never been able to see your messages because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, you may still not love it, but if you don't love it, don't love it for what it's actually doing. AT&T announced it will merge its AT&T TV Now streaming service into the AT&T TV service that relies on an Android set-top box. Now, after the merger of the two services, customers won't be required to use the streaming box, but it will still be offered. The new combined service will also have no required contracts, and packages will start at $70 per month. The number of patents granted in the U.S. in 2020 was about flat, declining by less than 1%. Uh, but patent applications rose 5%, foreshadowing a return to the normal yearly rise in patents that we see. IBM led the way in 2020 with 9,130 new patents received. Samsung took second place in patents received and continues to hold the largest patent number overall with 80,577 patents. IBM is number two in holding patents with 38,541. The fastest growing technology on this year's list, according to the IFI Claims Patent Service, was computer systems based on biological models. So that kind of AI up 67%. Last year, the number one was hybrid plant creation. It wasn't even a tech thing. Uh, so we had a little change this year. Netflix has been busy. The company released its slate of movie releases for 2021 with 70 titles, more than Disney and Warner Brothers combined. Also an average of more than one new movie per week, really, for the whole year. They include directorial debuts by Lin-Manuel Miranda and Halle Berry, and Netflix may yet acquire films throughout the year, which would increase the list even further. Tim Berners-Lee's Inrupt, which uses the solid technology to let you control your personal data, has signed Britain's National Health Service, the BBC, and the government of Flanders, Belgium, as its pilot customers. With Inrupt's implementation of solid, the NHS will let you keep all your medical records in one place under your control, and then you decide which doctors and service providers get to access which parts of your record. And when they add things to your record, that goes in one place that is under your control. All right, that's the non-CES news. Now, 
the CES news. <laughs> TCL is showing off rollable prototypes. Keyword here, prototypes. One mobile design has an AMOLED rollable, although kind of more expandable than rollable screen, which can extend a 6.7 inch display up to 7.8 inches. It's less than 10 millimeters thick with a three millimeter bend radius. Another we briefly mentioned yesterday is an extendable display concept that unrolls on two sides like a scroll and is even thinner at point one eight millimeters, very thin. TCL says, don't worry, it's going to bring an actual, real, actual, foldable, flexible product to market this year, but did not specify what it would be. GM announced a new delivery-oriented business unit called Bright Drop and its first two electric delivery vehicles. The EV600 is an all-wheel drive electric van with 250 mile range, 600 cubic feet of space for cargo, and up to two. 1,200 pounds that it can carry. Features an auto locking door, interior motion detection, location tracking, battery management, and incident reporting. The second vehicle, the EP1, is an electric pallet. Uh, it has a 23 cubic foot of space that can carry up to 200 pounds. It'll have remote locking and unlocking location tracking and battery status as well. The container is lockable with a modular shelving system. It's really meant to carry items from the van in delivery situations. Bright Drop will also offer a cloud platform to monitor delivery operations. The EP1 pallet will be available early this year, while the vans will arrive in early 2022. Though FedEx is receiving the first Bright Drop vans later this year after participating in tests, which saw FedEx deliveries rise 25% while using the vans and reducing physical strain on the drivers. Bright Drop will compete with companies like Canoe, uh, Amazon and Rivian are working together on an EV van, and the UK's Arrival has a contract with UPS. So it's a booming space right now. Dolby announced a tool called Dolby Voice for PCs designed to remove unwanted background noise and echoes on calls. Also auto adjust audio levels. So if a voice volume is low or mic is kind of weird, it ends up being more consistent. If a conference call app offers stereo audio, Dolby says it can separate multiple voices to make them clearer and more natural sounding. Dolby Voice for PCs claims it can also improve speech recognition and intelligibility for voice assistants. Lenovo's ThinkPad X1 Carbon and X1 Yoga laptops are among the first PCs to use Dolby Voice. Oh, did you mention Lenovo? Uh, Lenovo announced a bunch of stuff. The ThinkPad X1 Titanium Yoga, a 0.4-inch thick 2-in-1 laptop that the company says is its thinnest ThinkPad ever, running 11th-gen so Intel processors, weighing 2.5 pounds, available later in January at $1,899. Lenovo also announced the ThinkPad X12 Detachable, a 12.3-inch tablet with a detachable backlit keyboard that's less than 9 millimeters thick and 2.5 pounds with the keyboard attached. Also uses Intel 11th-gen processors, certified with mil-spec A10G for shocks and temp and spills, arriving later in January for $1,149. Both those laptops include 5G, but that's not all. Lenovo also introduced the ThinkPad Plus Gen 2 with a 12-inch e-ink panel on the lid. Uh, they did this last year. This new one increases the resolution to 2560 by 1600, adds multi-touch that works with a stylus, also comes with a wireless charging mat. The laptop can go 15 hours on a charge or 24 hours if you just use the e-ink screen. That's coming Q1 of $1,549. And Lenovo announced several laptops running the new Ryzen 5000 processors we're going to talk about in a bit, including the ThinkBook 14P Gen 2 and the ThinkBook 16P and a whole lineup of Legion gaming laptops. The new uh, five new Legion laptops all come with Ryzen 5000 processors and RTX 30 series GPUs. The flagship Legion 7 laptop starts at $1,669.99 with an estimated June 2021 release date and a 4.2 pound Legion Slim 7. A thinner version comes in May with three models in the Legion 5 series shipping in March. Well, not to be done by announcements at CES, Acer announced the Predator T Triton 300 SE gaming laptop, which is at 17.9 millimeter thick, running on Intel's new 5 gigahertz i7 11375H processor and NVIDIA's new RTX 3060 GPU. It has an all new metal design, bit of a departure from what it looked like in the past with a 14 inch FHD panel and a 144 hertz refresh rate, starting at $1,399 and shipping in February. Acer's Nitro 5 gaming laptops in either 15.6 or 17-inch versions will support Intel 11th-gen 11th core H35 series processors or AMD's Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. 
with an option to upgrade up to NVIDIA's RTX 3080. The Nitro 5 comes to the U.S. for $749.99. It's $100 more if you want the 17-inch version. And the company also announced two budget laptops, the Aspire 7 and the Aspire 5, both with AMD Ryzen 5000 series chips. The Aspire 7 starts at $749. The Aspire 5 starts at $549, so pretty affordable there. Available in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa starting in February. And China gets the Aspire 5 this month. Uh, just a few more things to announce before we talk about the other big announcements. Uh, Razer <laughs> announced a new Blade 15 and Pro 17 laptop with support for the new RTX 30 series GPUs from NVIDIA. Each model has 1080p, 1440p, uh, and the 15 Advanced and uh, Pro 17 offer 4K displays. Models all run the 10th Gen Intel H series chips. Razer Blade 15 starts at $1,700. Blade Pro 17 goes for $2,300. Available for pre-order January 12th. The UK-based startup Lasso Loop Recycling announced that it's working on a prototype recycling container that looks like a dishwasher with a vertical slot of depositing items to recycle. Sensors can then scan those items as you drop them in. Non-recyclable items will be ejected back to you, hopefully not too hard, while recyclable <laughs> materials will be steam cleaned to remove leftover food or labels or other substances and then ground down for reuse. When the appliance's storage is full, you use the app to order collection. The materials are taken directly to manufacturers. That cuts out recycling plants. And Lasso says that the prototype should be completed later in Q1, but according to CEO Aldous Hicks, a final product might not be ready until 2033. So it's going to take a while with a projected cost of around $3,500. All right, we've got a chip announcement from Samsung, one of many at CES. Uh, the latest mobile processor, the Exynos 2100 5G, first chip with integrated 5G from Samsung, sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave. Samsung claims the eight core processor is 10% better and 20% lower at power usage compared to the Exynos 990. It uses three ARM Cortex A78, four ARM Cortex A5, and a custom ARM Cortex X1 core. It's paired with the Mali G78 MP14 GPU and new Tricore Neural Processing Unit. No word on what devices would get the new chip, but I'm guessing one that Samsung will announce soon will probably have it. The Japanese health startup Quantum Operation demoed a prototype wearable that it claims can accurately measure blood sugar from the wrist without breaking the skin. The device uses a small spectrometer to measure blood sugar. It also packs in ECG and heart rate sensors and is able to display data within 20 seconds of being put on. Quantum expects to sell the devices to insurers and healthcare providers. Okay, just four more of these quick ones before we get to like the Intel and the AMD stuff. <laughs> Auto supplier Aptiv announced a new advanced driver assistance system available to manufacturers. Platform can scale from subcompacts to full size sedans with only the need to scale the number of sensors as the vehicle changes size. Aptiv claims that by using a pre validated platform, automakers could save 20 to 30 percent in building level one through three autonomous vehicles compared to its previous solutions. PopSockets announced they'll be releasing MagSafe-compatible phone holders for the iPhone 12 lineup, starting with its popular Pop Grip. A Pop Wallet Plus is also planned. That's a wallet case with a Pop Grip on the back. There's also two mounts planned, a multi-surface mount and a mount specifically for a vehicle, both of which will work with existing PopSocket mounts. The new Pop Grips will arrive in spring, with the new mounts coming this summer. Razer announced its typical concepts. Got two of them to talk about. Project Hazel is a N95 mask with RGB lights, a transparent front cover so people can see your mouth, and a built-in mic to amplify your voice. That one has a shot of maybe becoming a real product, but Project Brooklyn, the gaming chair with a 60-inch curved OLED screen that folds into the seat's back, maybe not real. Uh, it does have left and right pullout trays that can set at different heights. That seems achievable, but it's cool to look at. Not real yet, Tom. Yet. <laughs> Uh, Asus announced a number of products as well. It's CES after all, you know, everybody's got an announcement. There's a 32-inch ROG Swift 4K, 120 hertz gaming monitor with HDR600 and HDMI 2.1 coming in Q2 of this year. The Flow X134 is a 13-inch ultra-portable convertible with an AMD Ryzen 9 5980 HS chip and external NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 GPU. You can pre-order the bundle now on Asus's site for $3,200 US dollars and the ROG Z 
Zephyrus Duo 15 SE has a main 15.6 inch display, a secondary 14.1 inch touchscreen that lifts up when you raise the lid on the laptop. It can handle the latest AMD and NVIDIA laptop chips starting at $2,899 for pre-order now. Finally, there's the, R there's the ROG Claymore 2 gaming keyboard with detachable number pad and the ROG Gladius 3 wireless gaming mouse. All Good right. names. Let's now talk about the big <laughs> announcements at CES, starting with Intel. Boy, it's been a Tuesday or yeah. Wednesday, wherever you might be. Intel announced new processor families, including 50 different processor variants coming this year, 2021. Intel expects 500 PCs to be introduced this year, running on one of these new processors. So let's meet them, shall we? The vPro platform has 27 variants aimed at thin and light business laptops. Among included security precautions is AI-based th uh, threat detection against ransomware and crypto mining, plus Intel control flow enforcement for attacks that usually evade software-only solutions. VPro promises 23% faster productivity at processing over the competition, like AMD. There's also the Evo VPro, which will combine security and manageability from the VPro with the Evo mobility platform. So look for this in a line of Intel Evo Chromebooks. Patrick, Robert, any thoughts on this before we keep going with Intel stuff? Do not pay attention to what these strange people at Apple have done. Look at the magnificence we are bringing to you, my people. <laughs> That's a good Intel voice. <laughs> All right, moving on. There's the six new and series 10 nanometer Intel Silver and Celeron processors targeted education systems. They promise 35% better app performance and 78% better graphics performance. Then we've got the 11th gen Intel Core H series for what Intel calls ultra portable gaming built on Intel's Tiger Lake H35 10 nanometer super fin architecture and process. This allows gaming in 16 millimeter thick laptops with support for Thunderbolt 4, Z graphics, and PCIe Gen 4 with resizable bar. The three models feature four core or eight th and eight thread CPUs with a 28 to 35 watt power draw. The flagship is the Intel Core i7 special edition with up to five gigahertz turbo. Acer, Asus, MSI, and Vio all announced H35 powered systems. So who Intel is working with on this. Expect 42 gaming laptop designs to run on the H series with parts by March. JSC315 asked in the chat, what's ultra portable? Ultra portable means it'll handle most games without giving you back pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yes. not, that's not, yeah, that's actually accurate. Coming later in 2021 will be the 11th gen Rocket Lake S series desktop processors with 19% more instructions per cycle with the i9-11900K launching in Q1 of this year. Finally, Intel also demonstrated the 12th gen Alder Lake processors due in the second half of the year. Alder Lake will be the first chip built on the enhanced version of the 10 nanometer Superfin manufacturing technology, combining new higher power cores with Golden Lake, called Golden Lake, with efficient Gracemont cores into a single product similar to ARM's Big Little Tech. Intel intends to market Alder Lake for use in mobile devices, laptops, and desktops. And if this sounds familiar, yeah, it's similar to Apple's M1 chips. Intel also announced it started production of the 10 nanometer Xeon scalable processors for servers with volume ramp in Q1. Yeah, man, I, the, the, there's a lot there. The H series, obviously, the one that's going to show up in products that you're going to get. But that 12th gen Alder Lake uh, that they're teasing ahead, that that is their attempt to say, we can do what ARM is doing for Apple, but with x86. And I will be very interested how that plays out. <laughs> yeah. Patrick, what do you make of all this stuff? I, You know, it's it's kind of echoes what we talked about this time last year, which is, oh my goodness, Intel cares about processors again. Computer processors, like the ones you find on your desktop or in your laptop or in your server center. Um, and this is just even more of that. It's It's been kind of interesting. I, you know what I mean? Like, didn't hear any mentions about AI for drones or peculiar, you know, this is, this mm -hmm, is, this mm -hmm. is super hardcore. Like, wow, AMD is doing a lot of stuff. Apple's doing a lot of stuff. We need to really hammer that we're going to do some amazing stuff that improves performance. I wait with bated breath. I want to see I want to see benchmarks and see what these things do in the real world and availability. 
All right, let's talk AMD. First laptops with the new RDNA 2 architecture and new desktop GPUs with RDNA 2 will arrive in the first half of the year. CEO Lisa Su showed Dirt 5 running at 60 frames per second on ultra high settings at 1440p. However, the big announcement was the Ryzen 5000 processor family for mobile, meaning laptops mostly based on the 7 nanometer Zen 3 architecture that is also found in the Ryzen 5000 desktop chips. So you're getting 5000 for laptops. The H series from AMD is meant for gaming and content creation, and the U series from AMD is for ultra portables. All but one of the H series AMD CPUs for high powered laptops have eight cores and 16 threads. The flagship Ryzen 9 5980 HS boosts up to 4.8 gigahertz and has 35 watt TDP. There's also the HX chips, a new H line for gaming. The Ryzen 9 5900HX, for example, has 45 plus watts TDP and unlocked overclocking. AMD says it beat the Core i9-10980HK from Intel by 37% overall, 14% for single-threaded performance, as well as 21% on the 3D Mark Firestrikes physics benchmark. The flagship of the Ultra Portable U series is an 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 5800U that can boost up to 4.4 gigahertz using just 15 watts of power. So it's the power of the 5000 without using up your battery. That's because it's in an Ultra Portable. AMD says it outperforms Intel's Core i7 1165G7 1.23 times. Uh, it also claims 17 and a half hours of general battery use and 21 hours for movie playback. We'll see how that works out in practice. AMD also introduced a non-X line of desktop chips, the Ryzen 7 5800 and Ryzen 9 5900 with 65 watts TDP, but still at that lower power amount for desktop anyway, running eight and 12 cores. These chips will be made available in pre-built systems, though. It doesn't look like they're going to sell them to you directly. CEO Lisa Su also showed off AMD's third-gen Epic server chip, codenamed Mel. Lawn. A test showed dual processors with 32 cores each with a 68% performance advantage over an Intel Xeon Gold 6258R. And PCs with Ryzen 5000 mobile chips are expected to start arriving in February. Uh, yeah, the majority of this is about those H series and, and a little bit about the U series, but about those Ryzen 5000 series chips. I... I, I'm just double checking now in stock. I think I I I want to see availability. I want to see parts that we can buy. I want to see desktop ship. I'm curious how many are going to be available. Like I feel like the ultimate broken record for the last six months. <laughs> I, but I think that says something that your reaction to the Intel chips was, oh, it's nice to see Intel focusing again. Whereas your reaction to AMD is, I want these. How hard is it going to be to get them? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, a friend of mine and I have both been trying to buy one of the 5000 series desktop processors since they launched. And it was like they launched and they sold out. And then there were, uh, you know, some available for like a day in November. And then there were some available for literally like a day in December, I think. Uh, you know, if, if you know different, do me a favor, you know, tweet at Patrick Norton and tell me where they're all going. But you can, you know, you can buy pre built. It's like buying a 3000 series GPU. If you have the coin, you can spend a staggering amount on eBay. Um, you can buy a pre-built system if you can actually find one but availability and all this stuff you know the we we you know again we wait with bated breath if if we can buy it i'll be excited robert you have any more thoughts on either amd or intel i'm just thrilled for ultra portable performance really because yeah. that's when i buy notebooks nowadays if i can get it under three pounds that's what I want. It is yeah. fantastic to be able to have something that does all of that. I do not expect graphics at, at that size point, but in terms of just having the, the power to do all the work I need to do in some cases, well, I have a brand new workstation now, but prior to that, my notebook was often outperforming my workstation using solid state storage technology along with a great Intel processor in addition to their Wi-Fi and Bluetooth con connectivity, which they, they seem to keep updated pretty well. So I'm, I'm thrilled there. I, I am not a gaming notebook person per se, but it's nice to have at least a chip that can do something with some oomph where I'm not totally just wrecking the, the detail levels and everything like that when I want to do a little right. gaming on the road or, or so to speak. Yeah, it looks it looks to me like Intel is is still very focused on business, uh, which makes sense. That's where they're going to sell a lot. 
uh, and AMD uh, is more widely focused on the consumer. But you mentioned uh, graphics, uh, Robert, and uh, you can get some good graphics in your laptops now, thanks to our next announcement. NVIDIA announced the RTX 3060, 3070, and 3080 GPUs for laptops. NVIDIA says the 3060 can do around 90 frames per second at 1080p with ultra settings. Uh, they used Fortnite as an example. Uh, they think laptops with the 3060 should start around $999. The 3070 can do 90 frames per second and 1440p, and they think those laptops should start around $1,299. And the 3080 can do more than 100 frames per second at 1440p. And if you have to ask, I guess you can't afford it because they didn't put a price on that one. First laptops with 3070 and 3080 should start arriving January 26th with RTX 3060 laptops coming later. NVIDIA expects more than 70 RTX 30 series laptops coming from OEMs. NVIDIA also announced RTX 3060 for desktops for $329, so pretty cheap. Designed to replace the GTX 1060 Pascal cards, 3060 has 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 RAM and the usual RTX apps and DLSS support, as well as resizable bar. It's only behind the 3060 Ti and teraflops, 13 shader versus 16.2, 25 ray tracing versus 39.7. RTX 3060 arrives late February worldwide. Now, if you noticed, resizable bar, NVIDIA's uh, optimization only on the 3060 for now. NVIDIA is launching support for it. Resizable bar, if you don't know, gives compatible CPUs some direct access to video memory for performance games. NVIDIA is working with AMD and Intel to bring it to a wide range of motherboards later this year. So it's launching on the RTX 3060 desktop we just mentioned, but it's also coming in March to earlier RTX 30 series GPUs through a vBIOS update. Intel's 11th Gen H and S series processors and select 10th generation systems will support it as well. Uh, which are you more excited about, Patrick? The uh, you know higher GPU NVIDIA in your laptop or the resizable bar? A little bit of both. Uh, the the seeing these seeing these chips come out in the laptops, I think is going to be amazing for gaming performance, especially at those prices. Um, you know, I'm more excited about seeing the 3060 ship because I want to be able to use a bunch of the RTX broadcast app, which you can't use without an RTX card. But RTX cards have been on obtainium not mm -hmm. to hammer on that thing again. So one of the things is like, you know, can they deliver them in volume in February? You know, some people are saying it's not going to be available in volume in May. I'm just, I'm, I'm excited for the laptops. Uh, I think that's going to be how a lot of people get next generation gaming performance at this point. Uh, Robert, I'm excited by recent. I'm, I'm excited by the resizable bar functionality. That was recently added to my Asus motherboard in my new workstation as a BIOS update, and I applied that. And if I can get my hands on a new graphics card with, say, up to 20 gigs of RAM, where I'm not always using that for gaming, it would be nice to take advantage of that high-speed RAM with a compatible motherboard to see what that can really do for me with the variety of apps out there, be it content creation, and gaming, of course, but <laughs> but if you're not using all that VRAM, it seems like an awful waste where it just sits there idle most of the time, and that's where yeah. that's where the BAR technology is really just uh, something I'm, I'm glad I have a motherboard that supports, and I look forward to actually trying it out. All right, Sarah, tell us what Sony's up to. They they didn't announce a chip. There's got to be other stuff. <laughs> there is, turns out, Tom. Sony announced a virtual concert technology, among other things, but we'll start with that. In a demonstration, artist Madison Beer performed as a virtual avatar in virtual Sony Hall in New York in front of virtual fans. You know, we can't really have concerts anymore, so this is a thing. Beer was in a studio wearing a VR suit to do the performance, and a full Madison Beer concert will be accessible on PlayStation VR and Oculus VR later this quarter. I'm sure if it's a success, we will see other artists following suit. Sony also showed off its AirPeak quadcopter with Sony's Alpha mirrorless camera and AI image stabilization for filmmakers and includes two landing arms that lift up on takeoff. The AirPeak will be available this spring if you're feeling creative, might want to look at that. And then remember Sony's Vision S car prototype from last year's CES? It was a prototype. It is back, still a prototype, in a video shot by AirPeak on a private track and public roads in Austria. The Vision S now has 40 sensors for 360 degree awareness. And the video also shows a voice assistant, gesture controls, video game compatibility, 5G connectivity, and wireless software updates. 
There's also an end cabin camera to identify who's in the car. It can also use that to learn a driver's preferred temperature, music, driving routes, among others. The dashboard length display screen also has five plain card size titles in the center, camera, settings, navigation, music, and video, uh, assumedly also customizable. And partners include Bosch, Continental, Allmotive, Electrobit, Vallejo, Vodafone, ZF Group, Here, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and BlackBerry QNX. So we got car parts, we got software makers, we got connectivity, we've got autonomous systems. It appears Sony is making a car. Some yeah, kind. for real. Yeah. In fact, Magnus Sturz, president, announced that contract automobile manufacturers that it, that it has will continue partnership with Sony on the car. And we've talked about that company and recent history on this show as well. If you want to move on from cars to TV sets, uh, Sony's got you covered there. The company announced new Bravia XR TV sets will let users stream movies in high quality through the Bravia Core platform. Sony's Pure uh, Stream will stream Sony Pictures movies at 880 megabits per second. That means UHD Blu-ray quality lossless streaming. And users get a different number of credits based on the model of their TV that can be used for those movies. Kind of an interesting trend we're seeing. I am excited. Uh, the fact that they can do an 80 megabit stream, if they can do that to anybody who can receive it, that that is coming very, very close to what you can do with a 4K UHD Blu-ray movie in terms of the actual bit rate. Sony has had a long history of doing 4K streaming products, including uh, a product I still have, but I don't know if it's even supported anymore. But they were one of the first to provide not only a streaming service with recent run movies, but in the highest quality you could get. Uh, matching what was available on disk at the time, and it included a hard drive built in so you could actually buffer things out if your connection wasn't so hot. Here they're kind of implying that it's going to be a decent internet connection required before it will uh, perform at its best. So I'm curious to see if or what kind of buffering they may offer within that system, be it just RAM, a bunch of RAM, or even a small hard drive or an SSD or something like that. It's an interesting way to demo their technology, too, to just build it into the TVs and say, here, yeah, make good use of this TV we gave you. Here's some credits. Get some Sony movies. <laughs> they were the they were one of the first to apply a game console directly to their TVs in terms of the old PlayStation gaming service that they used to offer on some of the premium models. And as we've seen at CES this week, it's, it is changing and new services are popping up to be integrated into the most popular TVs out there. Folks, we know you got opinions. A lot of you are like, Sony's not making a car, Tom. Come on, talk about it. Go into our uh, <laughs> subreddit, submit some stories, and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about home theater trends in just a second. CES is always filled with home theater products, but each year has a different blend. There's always televisions, though. Even virtually, it's filled with televisions. Patrick, what are we seeing? Oh, my goodness. Uh, one thing to think about is CES is way smaller this year than it was last year. I believe there were 4,500 exhibitors at CES uh, 2020, CES 2021. It's more like 1,900 exhibitors. So many companies just aren't there. And a lot of companies that are are there aren't really showing anything new uh, except for televisions. And Robert will tell you about all of the televisions. I mean, there were a lot of televisions. <laughs> yeah. So without without just <laughs> listing model numbers, Robert, what what are what are some of the trends we're seeing in the technology amongst all these TVs? Well, for the LCD televisions, we're all familiar with. They're switching to better and better backlighting systems. In this case, using a mini LED in terms of just covering the back of the panel with tens of thousands of LEDs to create better zone control for local dimming, as well as just improving the brightness. Many of the premium TVs are also offering now. Quantum dot technology for better color as well. One of the cool things I'm seeing is that AI this year seems to be even more mature than it was last year. Last year, it was mostly very targeted systems being used to improve video quality. This year, there's a big switch toward multi neural networks being used to process not only the video for everything from AK upscaling to, <laughs> excuse that light going out, uh, AK upscaling all the way to things like audio performance in terms of either 3D audio processing or just creating a situation where the TV can analyze the room it's in and correct the audio accordingly and make it sound even better. Uh, for me, it was also about the 
we've we've heard about RGB laser projectors quite a bit uh, in the last couple of years, but there's been no actual physical product in our hands that is even in the realm of affordability. This year, we're going to see a product from Samsung and Hisense, both incorporating full RGB red, blue, and green lasers as the light source, providing in excess of BT2020 color, the color standard for HDR video. It actually exceeds the spec. Brightness has never been uh, any better than it's getting right now. And these products, while still expensive, are a fraction of what they would have been even a year or two ago. That to me is the cool thing. In terms of micro LED, where they're creating actual tile-based technologies, and we're all familiar with this with outdoor signage and other products like that, large format displays, those are becoming approaching consumer levels. In terms of like what Sony did with their crystal LED modules and Samsung with their, starting with the wall last year, now with integrated TVs that basically put all the panels together for you at specific sizes. These are still very expensive, but this is the first year where I've seen anybody, and in this case, Sony, actually declare that it's DIY friendly in the sense of being able to integrate, connect, and set up these panels for if you are in the mood to create a 110 inch or, or a 24 foot screen for that matter. It's all gonna be good. Now, everyone's interested in the OLED panels. That is probably where all of the focus has been this year. LG is the major manufacturer for most of the OLED TVs we see. I am not seeing that change, at least here in North America, for 2021. What I am seeing, though, is a push toward increasing the brightness. And I would say Panasonic professional OLED panels, based on LG panels, were the first to really get this going last year through the use of a heat sink technology, basically covering the back of the panel with aluminum that, in essence, helps it not only become brighter, but they're also claiming that it improves longevity of the panel itself. They're talking upwards of 1,000 nits or greater, and that's about a 25% increase over what we were seeing in 2021. For LG, their premium panel for this year is gonna be the G1 series. That is where they're putting all of the new technology, including a new OLED material that supposedly improves the color performance of red, blue, and green. So those subpixels being generated from a consistent color are going to be able to be brighter in addition to just delivering something that exceeds what was going on last year. Historically, LG panels have had problems with the green in particular. They weren't green enough. And they explicitly mentioned this as being one of the performance improvements. However, LG this year has also drawn a line in the sand saying that the G1 is going to represent what's new. And now they've added an A1 series for an entry-level model that will bring pricing down, as well as a new screen size. They've announced a 42-inch panel, at least LG display did. LG Electronics and others will have the option to integrate these into their, into their designs, but it should bring us back from, say, a 48-inch panel, which was super popular last year, to a 42-inch panel, which may work better for more people. On the a upper end of, kitchen, of it... A lot yes. of kitchen TV upgrades coming this year for people. Because in, in that smaller screen size, there's just never been anything even remotely premium. There's been some good televisions, but the difference between a good... LCD flat panel and even an average OLED flat panel at this point is huge in terms of the, the image quality. Indeed, and LG has also announced an 83 inch panel size, which you will see at the premium uh, for a variety of different manufacturers out there. So there is a new super size. The biggest OLED panel I've seen is still the Z1, which is their 8K panel that goes all the way up to 88 inches. Pricing, you know, to be determined on all of that. And when it comes to all of these TVs, one thing I can tell you that's different for sure is the implementation of HDMI 2.1. In particular, this year it seems to be that all the hiccups we saw with the introduction of this technology in 2020 have been resolved. Things like 4K 120, uh, variable refresh rate, auto low latency mode, enhanced eARC or eARC itself. All of those now are checkbox features on every premium TV. If they're offering HDMI 2.1 and the panel's capable of 120 hertz, they're gonna offer all of the features they can for specifically gaming in particular. And that's a good thing. This should be the year where we have far fewer headaches, particularly with like the graphics card driver updates of recent uh, applying directly to the features of these TVs in addition to the new game consoles out there. Everybody's flagship TV is supporting it, and I'm really, really glad to see that. We're also seeing a lot of, oh. No, no go ahead. I, I would also say too that uh, 
companies like TCL, we talk about 8K panels in general. And uh, while that has been kind of a premium target for a long time, TCL specifically announced that they're bringing their 8K series all the way down to their 6 series. Uh, they have a brand new 8 series, which will feature an impressive mini LED backlight with 10, tens of thousands of LEDs illuminating that panel. They have a new performance slash value series in the 7 series. But the 6 series is kind of that balance we've all become accustomed to where you get really good bang for the buck. And they're claiming that they're going to have an 8K version of that 6 series sometime this year in addition to some 4K series panels. Also, size-wise, there are plenty of 80-plus inch options this year at good pricing. We will see uh, from all of the manufacturers. Being able to produce an 80-plus inch panel doesn't seem to be the problem it's been for a long time, uh, at least at prices people are willing to pay. And you combine that. Once you get above 80 inches, I think that's where AK really kind of comes into its own in terms of it, it's kind of nice then because you get a more seamless-looking picture even if you're really close to it. Man, there's so much good stuff, uh, and it's good news about TVs out of CES this year. Folks, if you want to know more about that and you want to know more about receivers and soundbars and headphones, uh, Patrick and, and Robert are always talking about it over on AVXL. Uh, let's wrap things up, Sarah. Who are we going to shout out today? We are shouting out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ken Hayes, Tony Glass, and Jeffrey Zilks. Thank you all to our patrons. And if you ever have feedback on anything we talk about on the show, we'd love to hear it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thanks to Patrick Norton and Robert Heron. I know you guys work together, but <laughs> Patrick, where can people find your work? Uh, A-V-E-X-C-E-L dot com. Just, uh, if you have a question for us, email ask at AVXL or tweet at Patrick Norton. Excellent. Robert Heron, thanks to you as well. I really love it when you're on the show because I learned so much about TVs that I'm not going to buy, but I still love them. Uh, where can people <laughs> find your work as well? Uh, hit me up on Twitter, at Robert Heron, or visit my website, heronfidelity.com. That's where I post a lot of cool stuff. Folks, we love our patrons, uh, and so if you stick with us, uh, we're going to give you some Patreon loyalty rewards. You can get a unique sticker, mug, T-shirt, or hoodie every three months as long as you stay a patron at a certain level or above. Each one has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo. There's mugs. There's hoodies. This mug that I'm, I'm holding in my hand right now has a illustration of Roger. You get that uh, in the second uh, <laughs> quarter uh, that, that you're a patron. So go get the details, patreon.com slash DTNS. Everybody, we are live Monday through Friday. CES week rolls along and we'll be back tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. If you can join us live, please do. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back, back tomorrow with Scott Johnson and Richard Gunther. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>